Our speaker for tonight, Drew Wingard from Sonex. Um, he started uh, this company uh, in 1996 already, so it's a while ago. Um, so it, Interconnect has been around for a while, and the interesting thing about on-chip Interconnect is if it works well, you don't even know it's there. Isn't that cool? Um, so uh, as you can see, we don't have masses of people here tonight, which I sort of predicted. Like, It's not a really sexy subject, uh, but having been in the domain of trying to build high-performance chips, I can tell you uh, it's a challenge, certainly on the engineering side. Uh, so Drew is going to tell us all about how, uh, how difficult life is, how more difficult it's going to be, uh, but how the future will look like if we solve it in an intelligent manner. So, Drew. Uh, thank you, Hans. And I'll, I'll apologize in advance. I'm uh, a bit under the weather, but as long as my voice holds, we should be okay. Um, so, uh, I'm a co-founder of Sonix. We, we started almost exactly 15 years ago. Sonix is originally an acronym that stands for Systems on ICs. It never was about audio. It was always about how to integrate big digital chips. Um, and uh, I've had the opportunity and pleasure of working with a lot of companies in that domain for the last 15 years. So the outline of my talk for today is, um, I think we had a, a nice teaser in the abstract about this $100 million challenge, which is, I think, a, um, a barrier that many companies building advanced SOCs face today, is how do you actually um, justify a $100 million NRE type investment um, trying to target these SOC applications. And I'll talk a bit about what I think of as some key solution aspects and then finish with some you know, kind of future challenge and opportunity material. So um, th this graph from uh, Semico, which I, don't know, I think I'll abandon the pointer for a bit, um, talks a bit about um, a breakdown of the, where the costs go in a, a large SOC program um, by process node. And the data is, is a bit dated. Is a bit dated. I, I would have liked to have grabbed some more recent data. Um, but their estimates for the 45 nanometer node show the development costs for the hardware part, not including software, um, approaching $80 million. And many of the estimates for 28 nanometers show it getting past $100 million. That's the $100 million problem. Um, if you look at the size of the, of the bars here, you'll see that um, the architecture and verification tasks are growing much more rapidly than the others. Um, we've been worried for 15 years about mass costs, but mass costs barely even show up on this diagram, as long as you get it right the first time. Now, of course, the cost of a spin is still, you get to pay that number over and over again, so, so that's not good. But you know, it, it's not mass costs that limit the ability to build SOCs. It's the design costs. It's getting it right, building the right SOC in the right time. And, and yeah, there's no software um, in here, and a lot of people are reporting that software costs are growing faster than hardware costs for these designs, which is why the Android talk is so interesting. And then I think there's a, a very different viewpoint on Android if you come at it from the SOC perspective. You know, to the, the SOC developer, Android is a way of reducing my software costs. Um, now, where's the $10 thing come in? Well, um, here's a, I mean, it's a, not the most recent data. It's a I supply chart from 2009 estimating the cost of the two major SOCs inside an iPhone 3GS, which happens to be in my pocket today. Um, and, and you'll see that, you know, arguably the two most complete, complex pieces of silicon inside this die, certainly from a design cost perspective, um, you know, each are sub $15. And that's, of course, at the launch of the product. For most of the lifetime of this product, you would expect that those chips would be down in the $10 or, or lower range. Um, you know, when Infineon started the design of this baseband chip, they didn't have Apple as a customer. I can promise you. Um, so they were investing $100 million on the come that you know, someone would end, end up buying this chip and shipping it in good volume. Now, in this case, it was probably a good bet. But many people in this domain are making that bet without such um, a surety of their um, reaction, of their eventual you know, success. How do these things get to be so expensive? Well, um, what we have is, of course, Moore's Law giving us a seemingly infinite number of transistors to work with. It's common to build SOCs today with about a billion transistors on them. So turning that into gates, which is the, the unit that most digital guys think about, it's more like 100 million gates. Um, so they give us the supply of transistors. What drives the demand? I'll, I'll say it's convergence. 
we keep integrating more and more functions from more and more disparate domains into these SOCs. Um, we see a continued movement of complexity of software. Why? Because it makes our uh, designs more agile. Um, that's good. Um, but it also makes them harder to verify in some sense. Um, the architectures that win in the domain that I come from, which tend to be consumer mobile devices, um, tend to be very distributed. Um, and that's because they get better um, quality results by using dedicated processors for the disparate types of processing that needs to happen. A dedicated graphics core, dedicated video subsystem, dedicated audio subsystem, um, and then all kinds of I.O. And so to implement those, they use multi-core CPUs these days, um, you know, DSPs and special purpose processors. Additionally, if we go back to traditional computer system work, there was an awful lot of systems that had all this I.O. with, their, you know, with a centralized DMA engine. Centralized DMA engines are largely gone. The cost of building address generation into each of the components is so cheap at this point that it's an easy trade-off that makes the software, the driver software, much, much easier to write by distributing you know, all that function along the die. What that means is for the integrator of the chip, I have a massive number of sources of traffic that need to be managed. Um, and I have a very, very heterogeneous system. One thing that's very different about a, a consumer SOC than a traditional computer system is these guys each have very, very different communication characteristics and communication requirements. So we've been doing this integration thing for a long time. I mean, decades. That's, that's what Moore's Law did for us, right? It gave us the ability to um, improve the pr products we were building by doing the integration. Um, why does SOC seem to be harder? And if you look at the cost curves, we're not used to seeing these cost curves. You know, computer system designs didn't go through the same exponential cost scaling functions. Um, so why is it harder? Well, I claim it's because the benefits we get of an SOC, which is something about performance. In some applications, it's a lot about footprint. In some applications, it's about power. In almost every application, it's about lower cost. And the size, power, and cost benefits largely derive from sharing. It's sharing one control processor across this whole platform. Maybe that's a multi-core processor today. But maybe more importantly, it's the sharing of memory resources, on-chip and off-chip, especially DRAM. If you look at the board level implementations of the systems that came before that next generation of SOC, what you'll find is there, wasn't, there weren't just two logic chips. There were two sets of DRAMs. And so it's really difficult to build these SOCs, which tend to have a predictability requirement. You know, we, the, the screen can't flicker on my TV, or the communication channel can't drop on my modem, um, with so much sharing going on. From a control software perspective, a lot of these designs have more than 100 interrupt sources on them for the control processors to handle. And um, the bandwidth, the memory bandwidth bottleneck associated with trying to figure out how to schedule so many different disparate traffic streams onto a single shared DRAM, which is the main communication buffer in the system, is very, very, very challenge, big challenge. So, I mean, what do I know about that? Well, um, my company, since being about four years old, whenever that um, dot com thing happened, and all those great networking customers we had started, you know, doing this, um, you know, we kind of switched to focus on consumer applications because that looked more interesting. Um, so, so what are the kinds of things that consumer SOCs go into? Well, you know, TV, high definition TV transition was a great thing for SOC designers. Um, and we'll, sh we'll show an example that I, I think Hans will recognize in, in a little bit. Um, gosh, video games have consumed quite a few SOCs, it turns out. Um, they have a different characteristic. The platforms tend to be much more stable there, whereas in the uh, TV space, they tend to change every six months. Um, and then mobile phones, which, uh, you know, anyone who's paying attention to the silicon business at this point recognizes that smartphones tend to drive a lot of the decisions right now for the whole semiconductor industry around, um, and around SOCs. Um, what I would argue is a key characteristic of these consumer SOCs is this relentless push for the higher quality user experience, better user interfaces, higher quality video, better, better cameras, um, more applications, all those things. Um, 
with this relentless drive to make sure we're always doing it at the same cost or cheaper than what we did it last year. And uh, I am proud to say that um, I'm inside all of those products. Um, so, so Sonic's customers have delivered well over a billion SOCs into the market at this point. And in fact, unless there was a production stop somewhere, you know, my, my customers shipped about a million SOCs today. So I think one of the things that's interesting to think about is, um, I said the sharing's a hard thing. How, what, what's this, the scale of sharing? Um, I'm sure across the years, there have been many, many presentations in this, you know, for this group around digital video, for instance, has been a, a, a popular topic uh, of conversation for many, many years. And so if I take a, a H.264 decoder block and I, I break down into, into its subcomponents, what you'll see is there's a pipeline. In many places, there's these pipelines of, um, of effort. And they're decoupled from each other through FIFO buffers or sometimes um, you know, random access buffers of various different kinds. And you'd say, well, geez, there's, there's a lot of concurrency here to exploit, but there's also a lot of lo locality. The challenge for some applications like um, digital video is the size of these buffers get to be pretty large. In fact, they get to be so large that, that in many of these things, you can't afford to build them on chip economically. And so we end up sharing or communicating among stages in a pipeline even through external DRAM. So external DRAM becomes both a private buffer for some of the subsystems and the uh, place in which we uh, communicate between them, largely to decouple the pipeline stages from each other. You know, and in, in digital video, we talk about whole fields of information, you know, uh, two million pixels worth of data. It's a pain to keep two million pixels worth of data on chip several times in, in building an image processing pipeline. And this diagram is trivial compared to what actually happens into a TV today. So um, video being a large, um, large user, <laughs> large um, benefit of the convergence of so many different technologies and SOCs, video now shows up in almost everything. Um, uh, my conversations with microcontroller vendors say that one of the big things now is people want to be able to run little video streams whenever you're at your point of sale terminal. Why, I'm not sure. I just want to sign my, for my credit card. But, you know, their um, video is showing up everywhere. And when we get into video, what we find is that, by and large, if you look at all the traffic that's happening at the top level of the SOC among the cores, it's not going peer to peer. It's going from the core to memory. Um, and because we're in a consumer electronics domain, the, uh, the, the volumes that we're going after and the price points we're going after say we have to minimize system cost. And that means using the cheapest DRAM that we can that will um, su support the end application. And so the result of that is the SOC architecture, where you would think of having this distributed computing system with lots of components talking to each other, really boils down to two connectivity patterns. There's a control pattern, which is the general purpose CPU cluster, telling all the hardware elements what to do. And that's very low bandwidth in general. And then there's a large fan in the DRAM. And so that's what drives the communication architecture of these SOCs. So from the SOC architect's perspective, what's important is to be able to maximize how much of the DRAM bandwidth that was paid for is used or usable in a predictable fashion by the system. So we have to get the, the throughput and we have to get the utilization up as high as possible so that you can use the minimum number of DRAM, the cheapest, lowest speed grade DRAMs that you can get away with. Here's the design I think Hans might recognize. Um, this is a design that was uh, uh, published by uh, Case Goosens um, from Phillips Research um, back in 2004. It's a design called the Viper 2, um, which was a, uh, a digital TV SOC. Now, here's a block diagram of it over here on the right. And, and I'll point out that memory controller there is a, is a pretty um, highly connected beast. And then the MIPS control processor over here context everybody else. So you look at the interconnect architecture of this design and you see those two things I just said. The, the MIPS is, is telling all these guys what to do via this fabric. And then there's a separate fabric, which is largely this gigantic MUX headed towards the DRAM controller. In fact, if we zoom in on that a bit, what we'll see is seven years ago, OK? This was a design that already had three general purpose processors. One, one uh, the TriMedia Core, which was a dual core TriMedia, which is a, you know, a well-known DSP that uh, Philips had in its library, and then the MIPS Core. But 
if I actually explode all of these connections and count them up, what you say is there's essentially 90 different clients of DRAM. And again, this is a design that's seven years old. The, 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 the complexity is, in order, is much, much higher uh, than that now. And, and that's what SOC architects have to face today in, in trying to optimize the designs. So what can we do to try to attack the, um, the challenges of all this? So I want to talk about four things. I want to talk about um, the basics of you know, what our industry has been working on for a long time, which is design, reuse, and semiconductor IP. Then I want to talk about the, um, the architectures that people pick, which optimize around the communication requirements of the, architecture, of the, of the design. We'll talk, uh, I can't ignore the memory system topic because that's such a key aspect in these high volume consumer electronics devices. And then I'll talk a bit about tools. Okay, so this is again a little bit old data um, predicting how many IP cores are going to be on a chip. Well, why is that? Well, if we're trying to manage the costs, what we want to be able to do is, of course, not to start over again each new design. We, don't, we can't afford to handcraft 100 million gates every time we're going to do a new chip, right? That just doesn't work. So what's, how, what's the chunk size that we're going to reuse? Well, for many years, we've been, this industry's been talking about IP reuse of usable IP cores. And we've got a bunch of suppliers of, of names you know um, who provide these. Um, design and reuse is what's helped it, supposed to help us control these costs. Um, but now the average SOCs have passed 50 cores. Um, we had a design complete last year that had over 200. Um, and that's, we don't think that's exceptional at this point. Um, and they're very, very heterogeneous. And what we find is the abstractions by which these guys communicate with each other ends up mattering a lot. So how do we get the cost benefits of doing, of doing reuse? We have to be able to reuse. And, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll put forth a thesis that in order to do that, we have to decouple them from each other. So sorry, there's a, I mean, there's some folks in the, I know, recognize in the audience who are pretty familiar with design methodologies and, and abstractions. I want to spend a couple minutes talking about the abstractions that, that I think we see as being used and, and required in this space. Um, from first principles, I hope everyone recognizes that the, the goal of abstraction is to minimize the number of objects that people need to, to deal with. I, I know I, as a human being, have trouble keeping more than about 10 or 15 things in my head at once. Um, you know, reasoning about design with 200 IP cores is pretty difficult. So you know, we're going to have to build some hierarchies. We're going to have to build some abstractions in order to be able to manage these things, unless we're building them all as arrays. Unfortunately, in the consumer SOC space, no one has been able to demonstrate an, an array or matrix-based approach that's actually workable. The, the cost, the, you know, the area cost, the power cost, and the performance cost of over-designing to that extent has proven to be too high. So, start off at the, at the beginnings. Um, you know, our ASIC design flow starts with some RTL-ish stuff, which is just an abstraction of the gate. And the communication primitive that we use at that level is the wire. You know, everyone who's working in silicon is very familiar with this level of abstraction. It, it's good. It's been very useful and productive for our industry because it, it hid the complexity of transistors and routing layers and contacts and vias and all that kind of stuff. And we've got these amazing um, design flows, Cadence is a big supplier of them, that can take that abstraction and, and produce a working digital chip. It's really great. The functional unit is the gate. We tend to have relatively simple combinatorial and sequential elements. It's the placement unit that the back end tools use. The communication unit's the wire. Very simple. Um, they can be point to point. They can be point to multi point, right? Um, and that's the routing unit we use in the back end. And the connectivity between them is the port. I'm going to talk a lot about these connectivity units. The next level up, I would claim, is, is blocks and buses. And the point of view of a block, which I, when I get into an RTL design flow, I get vectored wires. I don't have just one wire. I've got several of them I can put together. I can define a, a bus of these 12 things. Um, and it hides the complexity of that lower level. My block is normally useful function. Group for convenience, replication, I might have an adder, I might have a, um, you know, a register file, something like that. Pretty low level constructs. And, and the point of view of the communication unit, the bus is just a grouping of wires 
with some amount of selection and multiplexing. Because even at that level, when you start to draw the block diagrams, multiplexers become a pretty, com pretty common block or element that we use all the time. Um, and, and maybe the important point here is the bus is almost always passive. The actual logic that makes communications work is in the block. It's not in the bus. And the, uh, the boundary between those things is we call the bus interface, right? Um, in fact, and normally, it's indistinguishable from the bus itself. This is the place where I think we learned something at Sonics back in 1996 that we've been practicing for the last 15 years. The next level up, we want to have these IP cores. There's functional ones. And our claim is there needs to be interconnected ones as well. We want to hide the complexity of the blocks and buses. So the functional unit is that IP core. It's a complete function. It's a CPU. It's an MPEG-2 motion compensation unit. It's, you know, it, it's a core. You think about it as an element that could be reusable. But I don't want to use a bus for attaching them to each other. I want to use an interconnect core. And why do I want to do that? I want to isolate these components from each other so that I have confidence when I go to integrate this functional core into a new context that I'm not going to have to rework that core to match up with the communication characteristics of whatever my fabric or other architecture is. And I think that's, a, that's, that's an important distinction that you know, I think we recognize before a lot of other people. Um, and so the connectivity between those two is the socket. What do I, why, why do I use the term socket? I, I really do want to talk about light bulbs, but I won't. Um, from a designer, the socket is a, is a well-defined boundary responsibility. It's a place in which um, I can buy verification IP from Cadence or Synopsys. It, it, it's a well-defined interface around which I can prove components independently so that I know that when I bring them together, they're going to work. It's what VSIA wanted to go define 15 years ago um, whenever we started on this, this merry journey which led to almost nowhere, unfortunately. Um, so most of my history in working in this space has been focused on trying to convince people that you want to hook up functional cores using interconnect cores rather than buses. And then what comes next? And I apologize for the lack of contrast here. Um, we need to get, you know, I've got 200 cores on some of these chips. It's too much to manage. I need to package those up into bigger pieces. Some people are calling these things subsystems. I have a problem with the term subsystem because I see subsystems everywhere I look, and I don't find it to be distinctive enough. So I prefer the term tiles, um, but I want tiles and networks, basically. So the tiles are going to hide the um, complexity of the underlying com set of cores, and networks are going to give me the, this next level up um, so I can abstract the communication further. Um, and so you know, I want a complete subsystem to find my tile. Great instances of tiles. Uh, Imagination Technologies builds these, these really cool graphics cores that have embedded CPUs and all these functional units and a whole bunch of software. It's well abstracted for the, the end user. Um, Tensilic has gotten into the business of providing audio subsystem cores. Um, you know, the chips and media guys in, in Asia have some pretty decent video cores. Um, subsystems, tiles. Um, the communication network is up a level from what we were working at before, where we're actually working at the level of big, you know, more data structure-oriented concepts like messages, instead of thinking about everything in terms of bits and bytes and data. I think we can continue to use the socket at the network level, but we're going to spend more energy on thinking about things in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. And the, uh, the work that OSCE has done with the TLM2 is a great starting point you know, towards that vision of the world, I would say. So now I'd like to talk a bit about the communication-centric architectures. So I, if I can leave any, one message for you, I want to talk about, I want, I want to think about sockets pretty heavily. Um, I've invested pretty heavily in my career in thinking of this interface between the components in, in, in some relatively deep ways. So um, from my perspective, we can do designs from the socket inward instead of from the IP core outward. And the socket is the key to that. So I want to use a standard interface that defines the electrical interface, the logical interface, and the functional connections between these um, cores and, and tiles. Um, and it's completely symmetric. I can't come up with any feature I want for a, for a core or a tile 
that I don't need on the communication side. They're, they're, they're completely symmetric for each other. Um, it is a well-defined boundary of responsibility in which we're going to prove that things work so that we can um, decouple the design process and work in parallel. By doing that, we, en we enable the independent design verification and can ensure interoperability. So a long time ago, just before I started working with VSIA, I defined the socket, which is now called OCP. Originally, it was called the Sonics Module Interface, um, which is an interconnect neutral, IP neutral, massively configurable light bulb socket. Why would you want a massively configurable light bulb socket? Well, what we learned was that the different cores, this heterogeneous world in which we live, the components have such fundamentally different communication requirements that it was difficult to come up with a standard interface. That's what we learned at VSIA, I would argue. And attempts to come up with, okay, well, if we can't have one, let's have two or three, was that you always ended up with something that wasn't quite right. Plus, we deal with the fact that we want to be able to reuse stuff. Anything that was defined before the standard interface was agreed upon would have to be modified to meet the standard interface. And by defining a um, component neutral interface, we could um, make it much, much easier to adapt as long as the interface was configurable enough so it could capture the normal things interfaces do. And uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that um, while Sonics may have shipped a billion units, OCP has shipped probably three billion units at, at this point, um, given, given all the uses that we've seen. Um, but that's the beginning. Yes? Yes, it can do all kinds of stuff. You can have many, you can have one transaction that, that is, you know, pipelined on its, on its processing. You can have many outstanding transactions. You have lots of um, concurrency and reordering and all kinds of things like that. Those are all options in the protocol. What's locked down in OCP is how that thing works. So instead of having 10 choices for doing the same thing, we try to focus on having one. Um, and so the gasketing between an existing protocol and OCP typically ends up being uh, mapping between um, this way of, of describing flow control and that way of describing flow control. So, um, but there's another aspect to this. What does that socket give me? My socket gives me the beginning of building a decoupled system. Why do I want to decouple it? I'm focused on reducing cost. I'm focused on um, enabling reuse. I'm focusing on trying to give the SOC architect everything they need to adapt these components into the system they're trying to build. So what I want to do is to isolate these components from each other. And I want to do that, of course, at the electrical level. I want to be able to deal with clocks and voltages and timings and capacitance. But I want to be able to do that at the signaling level. I want to be able to handle a wide variety of signaling interfaces and event widths and flow control styles. I need to be able to handle up at the transfer protocol level different approaches to um, multiple outstanding transactions, um, different approaches to uh, different sequences associated with burst transactions. You know, this thing wants to be a critical word first, first critical word first burst. This guy happens to be a streaming um, style burst. At the identification level, um, fortunately, most of the cores that we use on SOCs today, um, at least in the consumer space, use a relatively simple address-based way of communicating with each other. If you're a DMA engine, the way you say, this is the resource I want to talk to is you put out an address. That's great. Now I've got to map that address into who the heck am I talking to. And, and there's a part of that that's the software that may tell the core what to go do. And there's part of that which is what the hardware does, which is I decode this address and I send it over there, right? I need to be able to do that. I also need to be able in many situations to identify who that source was because I may want to apply uh, or recognize the different communication characteristics each of those components have so that I can you know, treat their transactions differently. And then up at the performance domain, we need to be careful about um, the interactions of all these concurrency. The, the concurrency set, the total number of transactions outstanding from all of the initiators in the system, um, defines my available parallelism for the fabric and the memory system to optimize around. How do I want to let those things interact with each other? That's the performance decoupling aspect of what we're talking about. And quality of service, in our view, 
you know, comes in at that level. So if I look at how SOC design was being practiced 1996, 2000, 2005, even 2011 in a number of places, I would argue that we have a whole lot of people that are still saying, gosh, I'm going to do this the same way I put components on a board. Um, I've got my CPU, my DMA, and my DMA, my DMA controller, and I'm going to use a passive interconnect between them. And so in order to adapt them to each other, each of these components gets their own bus adapter. That's what we have to do in a, in a, in a pre-CB context, right? But I can't diffuse transistors in the first circuit board. All I have are passive traces to work with. So I have to build a tightly coupled architecture. And the first stone we threw in 1996 at this model was the problem with the tightly coupled architecture is I change any one of these components and those changes can have to ripple through the rest of the system. So we started off by recognizing that each of these components has a functional job and a communications job and I would like to separate those concerns. Once I do that, I can come back and re-abstract and I can think about each of these as local interfaces, independent from each other. I could think about um, proving things in a much simpler point-to-point -point context instead of this context of the overall system. I can then come back in and re-optimize what I see down below. And I can think of the logic that was the communication adapter, I'll call it an agent, and then isolate that agent from the others and from the internal fabric protocol. Could it be a bus? Could it be just wires? Sure it could be. Maybe it's something else. The important point of the decoupling argument is I don't need to care at the socket level. And, and um, Sonics, I think, has put this into practice pretty well. We, we just announced our fourth generation fabric technology last month. Um, I can plug the same IP cores into my latest one that I did into my first product because my agents isolate the IP cores from the fabric. I can change what goes on in this model. Of course, by decoupling it from the fabric, I've also decoupled them from each other. So I don't care as the system architect that the programming port of my DMA engine is only 16 bits wide and never handles more than a single reader write at a time. That's okay. And I can plug that into the same network in which my DRAM controller has 75 outstanding transactions with reordering capabilities and identification of who's, who's requesting what so that I can schedule things to maximize QoS. And those can be two primitive ports on the same network. It's the agents and the fabric that cooperate together to make that model work. And so, you know, we would call this thing smart down here. Okay, I've got a network composed of agents and, you know, advanced fabrics. I'm really proud of the fabric designs that my company has come up with over the last 15 years. But I'm way more proud of the agents, to be honest. Because I think that's the, the key, the essence of the decoupled architecture. The agents do what you'd expect they would have to do. They do the, the, the um, uh, protocol conversion, because we've got all these different flavors of things we have to handle. We've got to handle all the AMBA protocols. We've got to handle customer-specific protocols. We've got to handle OCP, all this kind of stuff. But the agents also are, are my boundary of decoupling. They decouple the IP cores from each other. They give each core its own local isolated environment. The way I maximize reuse is by making sure that this core used in a different chip doesn't see a different environment. His clock rate doesn't have to change. He can operate the same supply voltage. He can operate, you know, whatever he thought he had before, he can still have. It's the agent's job to adapt him into the system. Additionally, our agents are the place where we provide a set of services we call data flow services. And um, this is where we adapted quite a lot from the network model, where it's, there are certain things that we do in these uh, computing systems that are easier to implement or more valuable to implement if I implement them in a common way across the device. And they tend to be distributed services, things like power management, security management, error management, QoS, and then all this nitty-gritty stuff of dealing with trying to accomplish semantically equivalent communication across interfaces that don't agree with each other on semantics. From a fabric perspective, the SOC data flow requirements have to be satisfied by that fabric. And that's a big challenge for today's thing, today's designs. If you were going to build your own fabric, you would have a lot of choices to make about 
um, performance versus area, performance versus wire bundle counts, performance versus power. And um, in this example, which I won't go through of all, there, there's a lot of these different choices. Um, and the ones on the right that's underlined are all the ones that, that tend to exploit the most concurrency, but tend to have the highest cost to implement. And so you might want to have a range of fabric protocols for different parts of the design to make different choices about these trade-offs um, to, to match the communication requirements of that part of the design. And, and that's what we've done. But I want to talk about one of those aspects in particular, which is um, how do we deal with the sharing? Sharing is a big topic, right, as, as I pointed out several times. Um, and when SOC guys get around, they talk about this kind of sharing. They always want to talk about arbitration. How do I know who wins? How do I know who wins? But I want to argue that while arbitration is important, flow control is at least as important. And the people who've worked on large-scale data networks know this in spades. Because it doesn't matter what your arbiter does if the flow control says you can't go now. Okay? And that's the whole question of blocking. So um, the problem with blocking flow control systems is you can get it anytime you want to share a path. If you get a resource shortage along that path, you can stop everyone who uses that path, even if they're not impacted by the resource shortage. So I've got something that fans into a shared point and then it fans out back down below. If, if a path that goes through there to one end blocks, it blocks the sharing point and no one can make progress. In a non-blocking flow control system, you make sure that those sharing points can never block. You use more advanced flow control, non-blocking flow control, often credit-based. And um, the guys who are building you know, uh, supercomputer data networks, um, you know, I learned about it from Bill Daly, but you know, lots of people have learned about it from other places, came up with these clever systems, um, virtual channels with virtual flip flow control is the, the common way they talk about it, allow us to do this in a very structured way. Um, and, and I want to say that you know, they originally introduced this for deadlock avoidance and some other you know, purely functional reasons. But it turned out that this was a very, very powerful thing for both improving performance, improving link utilization, and the one I want to talk about is improving predictability. If I can guarantee that two different data flows can't interact at any level finer than a single cycle of arbitration delay, I can do a lot better in terms of guaranteeing end-to-end -end QoS. Every fabric that Sonics has built since 1997 has been based upon threads or virtual channels for exactly that reason. Yes? Um, so, how, how would, uh, how would uh, the protocol architecture utilize the mm -hmm. so, 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 John, the, um, the general approach of what I'm dealing with are transactions that are formatted so they could be targeted at memory. So I tend to be told I want to move this amount of data to or from this address. So the details of the instruction architecture are pretty living. Um, there are systems, of course, in which the, the primitive transaction types look more like FIFO, just a, a regular streaming transaction to a FIFO. Um, if those are truly point to point, you know, they always go from this sender to this receiver, there's more, no more effective um, interconnect I can offer than a wire to implement that. Yes? Ah, great question. Well, gosh, um, so far the wizards who implement the physical design have managed to make me relatively immune from uh, soft errors, so I don't need retry buffers. I don't need to worry about this packet didn't get to where it was supposed to go. That's really good. That saves me all kinds of error and all kinds of complexity. I don't have to worry about the cost of one wire. So I can use relatively more parallel protocols than what I would use in an Ethernet adapter, for instance, right? Because I don't have this thing that I've got a, um, a link that has a cable in it that goes, you know, halfway across my office and, and putting more conductors in that cable is going to you know, you know, multiply the cost of the network by a whole lot. So I can, um, I can optimize around that. Now, there's a bad side of that too. If I'm building an Ethernet system, each of my nodes in the network has its own memory. In fact, it's probably got its own DRAM and maybe even its own disk. 
The capabilities of a node in an Ethernet-based system are far higher in most cases than the capability of a core in an SOC. I'm using the interconnect fabric to get to my DRAM. I can't boot without the interconnect fabric. I can't do you know, anything without that working. And that means that we've had to make some substantial trade-offs in, in the protocols we choose to use and the approaches we take to optimizing for latency um, and optimizing for communications complexity. And so we end up with something with stuff that looks very, very different and tries to borrow the right ideas from those. So if you go back to my slide deck when I was pitching the VCs back in 96 and 97, I was saying, gosh, what we really want to do is combine the best of computing technology, datacom, and telecom in order to build these interconnect fabrics up. And I think that's still as true today as it was back then. What are the other things that, that we worry about? Um, you know, so, so we do worry about arbitration. Um, in an SOC context, I have trouble providing predictability, sufficient predictability, if I use simple mechanisms like priority. God, I wish I could get away with just using priority to do my arbitration. Um, but what I have is I have these very widely varying um, requirements. There's a chunk of the, of the data flows that are on these chips that are fundamentally isochronous or they are amenable to an isochronous abstraction and that's very handy. And that means that what we've ended up doing in our QoS systems is optimize around the idea of guaranteed bandwidth. Because an isochronous system tends to work well with guaranteed bandwidth as long as it has latency bounds. And so um, as the, in enabling the SOC architect, what we try to help them do is to map the massive amount of concurrency that's available to initiators down to a more modest amount of concurrency they're willing to build hardware to support through the memory system. And so in this example, for instance, um, our memory scheduler, I may take the 40 data flows that I have entering the network and map them down to um, eight independently flow controlled threads or, or virtual channels of, um, of traffic down at the level of the memory scheduler. And, and at those levels, I can actually keep those flows independent from each other. Yes. Guaranteed, yeah, okay. So the question is, um, what do we use guaranteed bandwidth for? And do we use it for deadlock prevention? And do we use it for debug? Um, the fundamental reason we offer guaranteed throughputs is because we believe that um, by doing so, we can make the, the results of the SOC far more predictable so that I can enable a SOC architect to say, listen, you know, the, the video that's going out this interface goes in lines of this many pixels uh, with, a re with, a, with a refresh rate of this amount, so I can predict pretty easily this is how much bandwidth I need to keep the frame buffer display um, fed. So if I program that bandwidth, level, that bandwidth amount into the QoS system, I make him a guaranteed bandwidth thread, he's allocated the right amount, then as long as he stays within his, his bandwidth allocation, I can guarantee him service. If However, that isochronous approximation for him wasn't accurate, and he goes above that amount for too long. You get to choose how long too long is. Well, then I'm going to demote him to best effort traffic because I can't make any other guarantees in the system if I let him go for too long. And so we nominally would map the CPU to be a high priority device. I have absolutely no idea when the CPU is going to need service, right? We're downstream of these crazy caches, and um, you know, the later generation ARM cores have 27 outstanding transactions. Um, there's a lot of them that are possible. How do I actually you know, map those um, into my system? Well, I want to give them the lowest latency service I can, but I need to set a pretty stringent um, bandwidth a uh, limitation on them because if they go past that because the cache miss rate happens to be bad for this, this chunk of time, I'm not going to be able to guarantee anything else about the rest of the system. And so you know, I do end up having to demote the CPU so that I can make sure the video doesn't flicker. So the system that we've built is all around that. Now, my approach to avoiding deadlock is VCs. By, by keeping the data flows independent from each other, by mapping them on independent virtual channels, I can give my customers a lot more flexibility about what topologies they pick, routing topologies and, and the like. And, um, and that's really the original purpose for introducing VCs into a lot of these data networks to begin with. 
Any other questions on this? Other data flow services we think are really important are power management. Um, anyone heard about the, the power problems in, you know, in SOCs? Anyone's phone got hot today? You know, my phone gets hot sometimes. Um, why would an interconnect network care about power management? Well, turns out that if everyone's communicating with each other through the network, then the network happens to know quite a lot about the transactional state of the system, which can be useful for debug. Um, but it's also pretty useful for trying to provide interesting inputs into the on-chip power manager that are built in some of these advanced battery-powered devices. So I can keep track of, gosh, you know, there's a, there's a request that showed up at this socket. So I'm going to tell the power manager, hey, a request just showed up that's trying to bridge between these two fabric pieces. This guy's shut off. Maybe you should wake him up. Um, I can provide inputs that help the power manager decide when it's a good time to shut something down because it, my gosh, it's a, it's a slave and it, no one's talked to it for a couple of milliseconds. I can probably shut him down. Um, but a side effect of how complex these designs are getting and the frequencies we're running at because of the, the depth of the pipeline in DRAM is that the total number of transactions that are outstanding in the system keeps getting up, get growing. So it gets tougher and tougher to decide how to shut the thing down safely. And one of the things that most of the IP cores that people are using in here weren't designed for is to make that operation easy. So something else that has been, you know, uh, that I think we had the chance to pioneer in interconnect fabrics was the ability to help do that shutdown. So what happens is the, the on-chip power manager makes a request to us saying, hey, well, I'm going to shut you and the guys you're attached to down. And then we can go ahead and start um, fencing off transactions. In other words, I'm going to stop accepting transactions. That flow control signal is really helpful there um, at transaction boundaries. And then we wait until all these transactions drain. And because we know the transactional state, it's an easy thing for us to do. And then once it's done, we can hand back a handshake saying, OK, you can shut off our clock, or you can shut off our power, and all those kinds of things. And um, it ends up being we can make much, much safer power state transitions. Well, when we look at uh, approaches without doing that, there are software workarounds for this. You can put in magic constants in your driver that says, I'm going to wait you know, 17 milliseconds um, to do that. Um, and if the number was wrong, well, then you change it to 18 milliseconds, right? And eventually, you learn that, gosh, I should make it 25 just in case. And so what happens is you build these pretty complex on-chip power management systems that, that are um, slave to this relatively complex control software that doesn't know when it's safe to turn things off. And so you have to be conservative. And so you don't save as much power as you intended to. And in fact, you end up with these scenarios in which the power ends up thrashing. I spend, I wait so long to be safe that by the time I shut it off, it's time to turn it back on again. Now I'd like to, to transition a bit to talk about um, one of the challenges that we see in DRAM systems. So, um, Computer guys know really well about the, the uh, memory bottleneck, right? I mean, we've, for 25 years, 30 years in computer architecture, it's all been based on, my gosh, these processors are getting a lot faster, but memory's not. In the space of the, the lifetime of synchronous DRAM, starting with SDRAM and DDR, the DRAM industry has given us one benefit. We have increased the pin frequency the DRAMs are on a relatively decent curve. Not as fast as we'd like, but not so bad. Um, unfortunately, we've done that without increasing the fundamental array frequency of the DRAM much at all. So what we do is we just keep fetching larger and larger words of DRAM out of that array and then sequencing it out really fast. So we access the array at about the same time. We just bring out more word. You know, it takes more cycles to um, send one word of data across the boundary. And so in order to do efficient transactions with DDR1, the minimum burst length was two words. That's that DDR, right? Both edges of the clock. When we got to DDR2, they did another doubling of the interface frequency versus the um, core frequency. And so the minimum effective burst size became four. With DDR3, it's now eight. Another phenomenon happens. Well, those bandwidths that I get as a result of those frequency doublings is really kind of nice. It you know, doubles and things like that. Unfortunately, this convergence thing means that my bandwidth requirements go up faster than that. And so 
while if I was built running exactly the same application with the new, DD, new DRAM technology, well, when I doubled the frequency, I could half the width and I'd be good. Unfortunately, the bandwidth requirements weren't fast enough. In, in many applications, digital TV being an easy example, the actual width of the DRAM interface to deliver the bandwidth I need also increased. So I get this unfortunate squaring effect. The minimum transaction size for, for some of the TV applications we look like in the, in the time frame of this graph went from 8 bytes of data to 64 bytes of data. That's a pretty uncomfortable number. A lot of the embedded CPUs that are used inside these systems have cache line size of 32 bytes. If the minimum efficient burst to DRAM is 32 bytes, and my, I'm sorry, 64 bytes, and my, and my cache is line is only 32 bytes, well then I'm now only using half my DRAM bandwidth. And if you start looking at stuff like MPEG macro blocks and stuff like that, which we fetch a lot in video, they, they're not nice. They don't like large burst sizes. We end up with a memory access granularity problem where it becomes less and less efficient the faster the DRAM system goes. Um, well, that's not good. Remember, we're, remember the, the, big, the big metric we're trying to improve upon or, or trying to optimize for is DRAM system efficiency. So what do people do? Well, starting about this point, we started seeing some folks saying, I'm, I'm going to get off this treadmill and I'm going to start to use more than one DRAM channel. So imagine I've got a system that's configured like this, where my primitive DRAM interface has 64 pins on it, data pins on it, and to do that, I have a set of 64 meg by 16 parts, four of them. So that's how I got my 64-bit wide data interface. I could build the same, same thing with the same number of DRAMs, a radius two independent channels, each of which are half as wide. There's even tricks that you can play where you don't increase the number of address pins and control pins. Cost you one extra chip select to do this. And by doing so, what happened? Well, of course the peak bandwidth of both of these systems is the same. But the transaction size of this one is half as big as the transaction size of that. Right? Now I can deal with my memory access granularity problem. And, and, and what, what are the implications of, of doing this? Well, Oh boy, that, that didn't format well. Um, one of our customers gave us 60 milliseconds of trace data off of their emulator platform for their HDTV, which th they happened to have built using our product. So, so we understood the design pretty well. And we wanted to look at what would happen if we just switched this single channel design with a 32-bit interface to DDR3. Because of the difference in primitive burst lengths between DDR2 and DDR3, if I operated the DDR3 at the same frequency as the DDR2, I would have lost 15 or 16 percent of my performance due to this granularity problem. Well, for those of you who've worked on these digital video systems, losing 16 percent of your performance is huge. You know, this is like the domain in, that computer architects get when they're building microprocessors where they start to worry about one or two percent things. The DRAM efficiency work in, in the digital, t digital video systems often are down in the one or two percent range. If, on the other hand, you use this architecture where you use two different channels in parallel and you can balance the load, which we'll talk about in a minute, well, now my primitive transactions are the same length, right, as they were before. So I have the opportunity to, to protect that. But the question here is, how do I do this load balancing? Yes? Who's optimized for what? <laughs> Sorry, John. So, you need, so I think the question was, um, isn't it still optimized for cache line fill versus the, the video? And I think um, if I look at my laptop, which uses you know, an Intel chipset, I believe, um, it's heavily optimized for cache lines. No question. Well, if I look at my TV, I can promise you it's not optimized for cache lines. It's optimized for the video pipeline. If you look at what that, it, I think my TV at home, I believe, is based on an ARM core. Um, and it's a pretty nice ARM core. But it's not the most important core on that chip. You know, the most important thing that defines the, app, the, you know, the performance of my TV set has to do with the video pipeline. And um, that's one of those things that people coming from the computer domain often have fun with whenever they get into looking at SOCs. You can build an SOC like a computer system. You can. 
But the result is you overdesign it. In the consumer environment, that's often proven to be um, an expensive decision. So you know, what we tend to find is that um, you optimize around what subsystem has the most important performance impact on your system. The mobile case is unfortunately the most complex of all in many situations. Because my handset needs to operate efficiently in many, many different use models. I don't have one of those fancy ones that has the front facing video camera, but if I'm doing a two way video call, I can promise you who the most important core in there is very different than if I'm making a telephone call or if I'm playing the game or if I'm checking my email. The, the different use models have a big impact on the power and the performance that the, the interconnected memory system has to support on there. And that's a place in which SOCs are harder than general purpose computer systems. I don't get to make some of the simplifying assumptions that we have no choice to make in a general purpose system. So this load balancing problem turns out to be kind of a thorny thing. I've got this, these two pieces of memory. How do I allocate my data structures so that as all these cores, 50, 75, 100 cores, sharing these memories, that they naturally balance their traffic across there? Well, early work doing that said, to heck with it, I'll make it a software problem. Those software guys are smart. So, you know, in, in my address map, I'm just going to break it in half. And addresses in the upper half are going to go to channel one, and addresses in the lower half are going to go to channel two. And I'll tell the software guys, just put your data in the right place. <sighs> Turns out that's a hard thing to swallow. Um, a lot of the software that's written for these components is it not easily under the control of the SOC team. I bought that core for imagination. I'm not going to go rewrite those drivers. Or the guy who wrote that code isn't here anymore. Or gosh, in this use case, I want this data structure to be over there. How well balanced does this traffic need to be? I mean, it, it's got to be, it's got to average out to being balanced, but over what window times? Well, our, our data says it needs to be balanced across the queuing delay of the memory system. Queuing delay. Well, I said there's a lot of sharing going on, right? The way we analyze these is really using queuing system theory. There's a lot of transactions in flight. Um, and you know, it's kind of the, the, the number of buffers I've paid for. If one of my channels, maybe the easy way to think about it is if one of my channels runs out of something to do, Amdo's law told me I just lost some performance I'm never going to get back. And I think that's the way to think about it. So you've got to be really, really well balanced. Um, there are plenty of systems that have been built this way. You probably have a set-top box on your TV that's built this way. Um, but the software, it drove the software guys crazy. The, um, and the software guys basically have revolted in a number of places and saying, OK, I can do this for two channels. I'm never going to do this for four. <laughs> OK? Um, and the number of channels is going to keep growing. So um, what your laptop does, what your PC does, is it does interleaving. The way it, it, it achieves it is we do interleaving. We do interleaving at the cache line size. Well, that's great if you're doing CPUs for general purpose computer systems. You can do it down in the memory controller. It kind of abstracts it from the system. Unfortunately, we're not building computer systems. And there are some easy to, to come up with pathologic cases in which that won't give me good load balance. Also, SOCs tend to take advantage of um, DRAM page locality substantially in some of their key processing things, the video subsystems in particular. And by interleaving down at that level, you end up um, occupying pages for longer than you would and get lower performance. So um, what we have found is it's really valuable to be able to map different regions at different interleaving sizes based upon the kind of data structures that are likely to be mapped there. So what's good for a frame buffer might be bad for general purpose software and vice versa. We'd also like to be able to use this abstraction to isolate the components, decouple them, remember, from how many channels there are. So maybe in my next chip, I got a four channel memory. So I'm going to do four way interleaving. I'd like to be able to isolate those from each other. That gets me into the fun of the memory system. So I won't go through this any, in any level of detail, but gosh, I had no idea. I mean, so um, I wrote a PhD thesis at Stanford on 
high speed memory design. Long, long, long time ago. I never really understood how interesting DRAM really is. Um, not from the perspective of the array. The array, the array works interesting enough as it is. But from the perspective of how do we actually think about it and model it at the application level. And it's an area in which um, we haven't done enough work as an industry, fundamentally. So if I think about the primitive DRAM timing parameters that impact utilization, if um, in, a, in, a, you know, in a DDR, DRAM, if I switch from doing reads to doing writes, I lose a couple data transfer cycles because it's a shared bus. And to turn that around, I've got to turn it off for, I've got to you know, uh, isolate my tri-states for a while. If I, um, if I send a transaction that, um, to, to a bank, to a different page in a bank that's open to another one, I have a page miss and I have to cycle the bank. All these things have an impact on it, okay? Um, oh, I, there's, this thing's pipelined. You know, I don't, get, I don't send a, a request for a whole transaction. I send a RAS, a CAS, or a prefetch, or a, a precharge fundamentally. Um, so that I can have conflicts on the command buses and all kinds of things. What's the characteristics of the traffic impact the performance you get? Um, things like what are the set of bursts, um, at the burst sequences, burst lengths, alignment, MPEG macro block fetches in motion compensation are unaligned, it really sucks. Um, you know, uh, often transactions are related to each other. Well, here's, here's one transaction, here's a second transaction, and I can predict what the address pattern is between them. I might want to optimize my, organiz my DRAM organization to take advantage of that. Um, how many transactions are outstanding, the, the mix between reads and writes? And a big one is what are the ordering constraints? Um, as soon as the system gets pipeline where there's many outstanding transactions between one component and DRAM, I have to care a lot about what the initiating component expects or needs from an ordering perspective. What's the, you know, what's the memory ordering model, memory consistency model of this line? And so we end up with this nasty matrix where you know, these things impact those things, and it's kind of hard to really model. It's hard to predict what's going on. Excuse me. Yes? Do your systems have cache for hand power? Excellent question. Um, most SOCs today in the consumer space operate without that. Um, ARM and MIPS, as two substantial CPU IP providers, gave us a poor man's solution for that in their um, cores of the generation just passed, where there was a way of coloring traffic that needed to be IO coherent and passing it through the CPU's caches. Um, which was a poor man's solution, as I point out, um, because it's not very efficient, not very effective. The most recent version of the protocols that have come out, both from OCP, IP, and from ARM in the AMBA ACE extensions, now support primitive, IO, as a primitive in the protocols, it, uh, support IO coherence. And so you will see that in, in announcements from all the major interconnect providers here in the next. So heretofore, you had to actually flush the caches so I think what you would find if you look a lot in embedded system design, you'll find a lot of mem copies instead. Instead of doing the flush, they end up doing a lot of mem copies. Yeah, but it's better than flushing. Because <laughs> at, at least the mem copy can be done without the CPU's help, right? I can use a DM engine to do the mem copy. So, um, if I've got a type of couple DMA, for instance, which is common in some of the ARM designs. So, so the, the other part is that usually in a system where um, the star of the show is not the CPU, the star of the show is the highest priority device, so that your priority system helps mitigate some of this stuff. So I assume you do a little bit of that also. Uh, priorities are important to us, but um, quality service guarantees are more important. Is the way I would the way I would communicate back to you. So you know, I, I want to make a contract with you about how much service you're going to get from this target. Okay, that's that's the contract. I know I know how to do the math around that. If I give you an absolute priority over other people, then I'm I'm having to rely upon your good your good faith efforts to try to live within whatever contract is made at the system level, and. Um, a lot of systems have proven that that's a difficult thing to get out of a third-party IP provider is, you know, an initiator that actually respects the contract that, he, that he's asking for from the system. Ah, but Duke, don't you have a bevy of software people that you can beat over the head and uh, sort of like just coerce into compliance? <sighs> Boy, it's a lot harder than I, I mean, I, I, 
I wish I lived in a place in the system where I could force that to happen. I don't, unfortunately. So, so I'm going to try to build hardware mechanisms that are simple enough and predictable enough to make this all work. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to move forward because I'm, I'm going to run out of time. So um, I've been talking about DRAM utilization as a really important thing, but I, I hope it's clear to people who've looked at building DRAM systems that to get to high DRAM utilization is actually in conflict with getting to good QoS. Getting good DRAM utilization is about trying to gather the largest amount of spatially local traffic into one batch and using it, because that's when DRAM operates most efficiently. Getting good QoS is about trying to parcel things up into smaller bits so that I can say, oh gosh, you're more important than that guy, so I'm going to let you go now. And they're really in conflict with each other. Um, and so in, in the consumer SOCs, we find that the, the memory system schedulers are really, really important task for getting, or object for getting that done. Um, I'll talk just a little bit about some of the challenges we see in SOCs that are a little different. So um, when we're working on video, it's pretty common that we're going to work in the two-dimensional space, right? I've got a frame buffer, and if I'm interested in what's going on in this pixel or this macro block, I'm going to want the pixels to the left, to the right, and above and below me. Lots of filtering algorithms look like this. Um, normal organization of DRAM is unfortunately bad for that. Normally, normal organization of DRAM would build a DRAM page as a partial row across this screen. And so if I go grab the pixel above me or below me, it's guaranteed to be in a different page. It's also highly likely to be in the same bank. And now I'm going to get page misses for these most common accesses. So people don't really do that. Um, if you go look at what the, your, you know, your graphics card actually does inside a PC, you can rejigger the row and column bits of the address to make the DRAM pages look square. So you know, there's nothing that says I have to do all the column bits as the low order bits, and then maybe my bank bits, my column bits. You know, what's the, what's the DRAM is, uh, you know, unimportant. You can permute any of the address bits. As long as you do it consistently for the reads and writes, it all works. So it's really common to do the same we call address tiling. So I can make my DRAM pages look square. And now if I go grab a 2D object, um, well, if it lives within a page, which is most of the time, well, then I get really high efficiency access. If it crosses a boundary, and I've organized it with a little bit of tricky math so that those pages, which are different, are also in different banks, then I can use the bank level parallels in the DRAM to try to hide the page misses inside that. And so you can actually get it where you pay one expensive penalty in the whole thing. Sonics didn't invent this. This is something that's been around for, for a while. But it's interesting to think about how you model and, and implement that in a, in a complete interconnected memory system context. And then we think about this multi-channel stuff. Remember I said I was going to do interleaving. Yeah. Gosh, I want to do interleaving and all this other kind of stuff. So um, how does this 2D object place? Well, the way we suggest configuring the DRAM system is so that we break the channels. Channels become stripes in this map. And so now a, a random MPEG macro block fetch, which in our system can be a primitive object, needs to be detected where it crosses the channel boundaries and broken into multiple two-dimensional fetches so they can be sent to the right places. Um, and we, do all, we end up doing all this in hardware. So I won't go through this, but these are a, a number of the things that, that we felt important to build into our memory system components in order to be able to optimize for the highest utilization. And mem our Memax memory schedulers, the thing we use for doing that. Um, and we have found that at this boundary, using a single unified interface with non-blocking flow control using threads or, or virtual channels is a great way of reducing the routing congestion on the chip versus having a multi-ported controller, which is often done if, the, if protocols like AXI are, are in use, where you end up with, in some cases, 20,000 wires. They're coming into the boundary of the DRM controller. From a tooling perspective, um, we've been fortunate to work with the largest SOC companies in the world. Um, we've been unfortunate to work with the largest SOC companies in the world. Um, they have very, very, very customer-specific ideas about what a good design methodology is. Um, and so we've learned along the way that the tooling we support has to be um, open. It has to be open enough that my components can be used in their cockpit their components can be used in my cockpit. 
my tools and other people's tools can all be plugged in together. And we've, we're fortunate that there's a couple standards that have emerged in our little world part of the industry. Um, the Eclipse framework, which is widely used in embedded system designs these days, and then the IP exec standards, which are now part of Accelera, um, which give us a base, some basic data plumbing so that we can make all this stuff work together. So you can make cadence and synopsis play nice with one another? Oh, I didn't say that. <laughs> I, I would not make such a claim. Having, having lived through a little bit of design framework world wars, I would not say that. Um, but, but really what's important in the tooling aspect here is to be able to deal with one reality that every one of our customers has, which is the specs change during the design. Sometimes it's that the component that's being developed comes out differently than was expected. Usually it's because marketing finds a new customer. So how do I get back today to where I thought I was yesterday? And that's where we've invested our automation dollars. It's around trying to you know, um, enable people to make rapid iterations around these relatively complex objects. To do that, it's really important to be able to visualize what's going on. And we've invested heavily in you know, visualization technology to help people try to analyze what's going on. So um, as we look towards the future, we'll talk about a couple things. Um, gosh, everyone talks about power and energy being principal concerns. What, what role do I think the on-chip network provides in that? Well, we're used to operating in a world in which we have a lot of flexibility around clock domains. And the EDA industry provides some pretty good tooling around trying to deal with gated clocks and multiple clocks and frequencies and tools that help you cross clock domains and all those kinds of things. But because of leakage, we have to do everything. There's a parallel for every one of these things on the, on the supply voltage side. I gotta have multiple regulated voltages, maybe five of them per chip. I gotta support different voltage levels off of those. I have to have different um, power domains then related, connected to those, and this on-off switching all over the place. And what's different about these than those is I can stop a clock on a dime. I can't shut off or, shut or bring these, these, these power FET switches back on on the dime. The inrush currents and things are just too big. I need state machines, and those state machines have to agree with each other. And oh, by the way, when one of these guys is shut off, I can't use him to communicate to the guy who's on the other side of him. So there's all kinds of dependencies about how all this stuff has to work. There's a big challenge in that area. Another thing that's happening is, um, in the mobile, here's where the mobile space has the unique opportunity to drive DRAM in a way it's never, never has before. Um, so um, we've got this situation that DRAM bandwidth needs are growing much faster than DRAM capacity needs because of all these crazy use cases we're going to do. We're going to do, you know, I want to hook up my cell phone to my HDTV and do stereoscopic display and all this kind of crazy stuff, right? Um, that doesn't require that much DRAM capacity. That needs a lot of DRAM bandwidth. Um, but we're so sensitive to power in this domain that we have a problem. How the heck do we get this out of here? Um, and so if you think about it, fundamentally the DRAM interfaces we have today are, it's the interface that's the bottleneck. I've talked all the time about how much parallelism we have on the initiator side. We have an enormous amount of parallelism on the DRAM side. We've got all these banks that are, that are in play and we're not really using them very, very effectively. So what if you could get rid of that interface bottleneck? And so you're limited by the DRAM bank bandwidth instead of the DRAM interface bandwidth. And it'd be great if I could get rid of the power of the PHY. And so a lot of you have heard of this wide AO stuff. What, what makes the mobile industry excited about wide AO is using 3D packaging to greatly reduce the power while greatly increasing the bandwidth of the memory system. Does it increase the capacity of the memory system? No, you can't stack more than four of these things on top of each other. You're not going to build a giant memory system. But you can build a high bandwidth memory system very effectively. Um, it's really cool. Um, it's only going to work if the smartphone guys figure out how to make it work in production, I believe. Because only they have enough volume to get us down to curves. Um, one big channel challenge, a single wide AO part is four channels of memory. Why? Because we've got 512 bits of data going in parallel at these DRAM banks, and, and, and that's just too much. Right? The, the granularity problem hits you really directly. So they broke them up into four separate channels, each 128 bits wide at 200 megahertz. So how do you balance the traffic? Well, let me hypothesize to you, my wide-eyed DRAM here 
four individual wide area controllers and someone who's smart enough to be able to do the automated lo automatic load balancing across the channel. Um, and, and so we're really excited about this as a model moving forward. Um, that four channel thing I was, where I, a seed I planted before about software guys being really scared about that. I think for the, in the mobile space, I think we're here. Um, and you know, we're pretty excited about what the opportunities are there. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, I'd be happy to take a, another question if I'm allowed to have one. Thank you, thank you very much, Drew. An excellent uh, presentation. Oh, okay.